doing. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and to, you know, and to build on some of these things that we have discussed previously. And it's all part of thinking about how we're driving mental health reform in this state. Can I also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we meet and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Can I also thank Checkup, particularly Anne-Marie Liddy, but also her team, David and others, for, for you know, putting on this conversation that we regularly have, particularly on mental health and about how things are progressing in Queensland, but also how we're drawing on some of the national, but also some of the interstate developments, which are, which obviously clearly apply to us. Um, just for people's knowledge and benefit, we as the Queensland Mental Health Commission, our primary role, and if I can just sort of you know quickly capture it, is to is to really sort of help the government set strategic directions when it comes to mental health, drug and alcohol, and suicide prevention. We're not responsible for implementation, but we certainly support and leverage implementation. But then we also do monitor, report, review on implementation progress to Parliament through the Minister for Health. So we're in, in the, an independent statutory body which, which tries to support government and the system and, 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 and drive change in terms of what's required. Look, over the last couple of years, apart from the pandemic, we've also had some of these major significant inquiries. So I really want to just touch on some of those critical aspects of those inquiries and their implications for us in Queensland. But also why I want to touch on the pandemic, because obviously that's changed the landscape, particularly around mental health. And so I think we need to also discuss about what are some of the ways that we collectively and everybody around the table here today or online will also have a role to play in actually addressing some of the mental health needs as a result of the pandemic. And then, as David said, I'll just touch on a few things that we've been driving and leveraging some of the things, particularly more broadly around system reform, but also specifically around the pandemic. As you know, I'll start off with the sort of the most major uh, sort of piece of uh, research and, and sort of inquiry that's occurred. That was a report produced by the Australian Productivity Commission inquiry into mental health. Now, uh, for people's sort of benefit, I'm sure that people have read the full 1,900 pages. Um, it's, it's really providing an economic lens on mental health. And uh, if you look at that inquiry, you will see about the cost of mental health, the cost of actually doing things the way we're doing it now, which is anywhere between 550 and $600 million a day. So the Productivity Commission is suggesting we can do things differently. The areas where we can make an impact, and I can unpack these, but I, you know, I'm not sure the time will allow it, but really around we've got to move the system upstream. We've got to look at prevention and early intervention to help people. We've got to support people to improve their experiences with the mental health care system as it is now, and also improve people's experiences beyond the health system. Obviously, a strong focus on workforce, and then we need to instill some sort of incentives and accountability for improved outcomes. That's at the high, high level in terms of what the Productivity Commission has recommended. And not only will that be beneficial to individuals and families and carers, uh, but it will be beneficial to our community overall. It will also be beneficial to our economy. And I think it's important for us to think about what does that mean for Queensland? And I will talk a bit more now just quickly around that as a result of that, the federal and state governments have agreed that they will develop a national partnership agreement on mental health and suicide prevention. And that's in the current stages of being developed between the jurisdictions and the federal government. And that's got some major implications for our system in Queensland. And I'll only mention a couple of these things and, and I can go into a bit more detail, but it's things like, for example, a lot of the bilaterals that will be done between jurisdictions and the federal government, the ones that will really have a major impact on what we're doing is things like the adult mental health centers you know, the head-to-health adult mental health centres. And they're designed, which I think is an important element, they're designed to address the missing middle, the people who are people who are too complex for the primary healthcare system, but not complex enough to get into the public system. And that's the largest group. If you look at the data, which the Productivity Commission report outlined in its, in its report, 
it clearly says that's the largest group. And so in some way, uh, I think part of the thinking is that the major gateway into mental health for everybody should be these new adult head to health centres across the country. Now, Queensland will get a number of those and so will other jurisdictions, but there will also be a requirement for a co-contribution. The other aspect of that, which I think is a really important aspect, is around the head to health child hubs. And this is for the first time we're seeing a shift early in age, early in, in the trajectory of mental illness. A lot of these child hubs will look at those families and individuals and children growing up in those adverse childhood experiences. Again, providing an early option for people to get into support. And again, Queensland, Queensland should get a number of those as well to build on some of the things that, that we have already done in this space. The other sort of aspect, which will again be important for Queensland is around further enhancement to the Headspace centres to provide more capacity for them to see people at that very early stage. So at that primary healthcare stage. And then there is further support to come around, they're calling it aftercare, but it's more for support for people in the sort of way back type of programs, which you may have heard of, people who present to ED and who may have suicidal ideation, but don't get an inpatient service and, and get referred to a whole range of services. A active and proactive follow-up of these people is also going to be further enhanced. And we've got some clear evidence that that's working already. One new development, which I think is a really important one, is probably a small start to this whole process around distress brief intervention or distress intervention, particularly for people living in the community who have particularly suicidal ideation. Some of this uh, experience and knowledge is based on the Scottish experience where people who are in distress, who won't come into the public system, whatever, need a level of support and so providing some of that intervention in situ in community through neighborhood centers through men's sheds through women health centers whole range of those other places is where some of this focus will be so focusing upstream to support people before a crisis occurs and then there's a strong focus on suicide uh, obviously with the national uh, Mental Health Commission and the National Advisor on Suicide, you know, producing a report for the Prime Minister around the state of suicide rates in this country. There is a strong focus around suicide, a whole range of things, but really a strong component will be around the postvention, supporting communities and people who have been affected and in grief as a result of a suicide. Just to touch on some of the major things which I think the Productivity Commission, but also the NP, uh, the National Partnership Agreement, sorry, will actually include, which means that the state system will change as a result of this. So I think just if you keep that in mind, this is important for us as a system to be aware of that, but also to be able to look at how do our services, existing services align with that, but also integrate with that. From a consumer perspective, I can tell you people don't particularly care who provides it, who funds it, what its uh, logo is, what its uh, you know, sort of the philosophies, as long as I get the service that I need at the right particular time in context to move on with my life is what I'm looking for. So I think it's really important that we're aware of this, that this doesn't just come over the top, it actually integrates with what we've got. The other one that I, you know, I'll just quickly talk about is really about, you know, sort of the Victorian Mental Health System Review, the Royal Commission down there. That focused much more on the Victorian system, obviously, and it's got some major implications and it was phenomenal to see the you know, Victorian government. I have never worked in this space where a government has accepted all of the recommendations before they saw the final report. Now, I know it's still gonna have challenges. None of this is perfect, but you know, I have not been, and I've been in this sector for you know, nearly 30 years, so I'm showing my age, but I haven't seen any government agree to to all the recommendations before they saw them. But I also have never seen, even at the federal level or the state level, a $3.6 billion investment in mental health. I just think that's, that's sort of, you know, a real sort of massive commitment to driving reform in that state. There's lots of learnings for us in, in Queensland and I can't, you know, and I'm, I don't have the time to actually go through all of that. But there is also, I'll, I'll just finish, there is also some, uh, and, and I've certainly been approached, and I'm sure the minister has and other people, about the need for a review in Queensland. Um, Queensland has not had a systemic review of its mental health system, not that I can remember. We've had bits and pieces, like the Barrett review and a whole range of things, but we haven't had a systemic review. And I think there is 
a bit of groundswell at the moment, certainly coming from some of the College of Psychiatry and some of the other professional groupings. But, you know, consumers and carers who are certainly in contact with me are saying, uh, we in Queensland need a review at the moment. Queensland is one of the lowest per capita spending states when it comes to mental health. So I think those reviews have generated both some obviously impact on Queensland, but also have, have highlighted for Queenslanders that maybe Queensland needs, needs a review. I'm not sure that people are really um, keen on a review of you know, a royal commission type where you spend 35 to $50 million on a royal commission. Um, some of the sort of commentary that's happening is people are saying uh, maybe the Queensland Mental Health Commission could do the review because Victorians didn't have a mental health commission as we have in Queensland and other states. And why can't the standing commissions be given their additional power that they need to be able to do a systemic review and not, and not have to spend 35 million or, or 40, 50 million and use that money to actually beef up services. So that seems to be the state of play at the more sort of national state level at this particular point in time. Just quickly, in terms of the pandemic, I just wanted to sort of touch on that. You know, we've seen the impact of the pandemic. And I think when I talk about the pandemic in the context of, of all of that, is that we have seen that in some way, uh, the data is clear that the whole population is on the spectrum of vulnerability, not mental illness, but the spectrum of vulnerability which obviously impacts on, on, on our psychological state. If you look at the Productivity Commission data prior to the pandemic, we had about 15 million people who were well on all accounts. And we had about five, six million people that were at risk. And then we've got moderate, mild, and you know, people with fairly severe mental illness. I think that's much more fluid now. And even people that were in the well, sort of in the well group, the level of vulnerability you can see is increasing, but also people who are at risk are now more at risk and potentially moving upstream. So I think the, that sort of spectrum of vulnerability, we're seeing mental health becoming such a huge priority at the moment. Um, in fact, we're seeing, and I was just going to go through some of this, increase in demand for services would, would, would certainly indicate that. We have seen, for example, anywhere, and, and, and again, depends who you talk to, at what particular point in time, are we reflecting Victoria or New South Wales, are we reflecting Queensland, but we've seen an increase in demand generally across services, and I'll talk more about this, between 20 and 50 percent in terms of services. So some of the online stuff has been, you know, depending if you talk to Kids Helpline in New South Wales at the moment, their increase is about 50 something percent. In Queensland, it's been in the sort of between the 20s and the 30s. Beyond Blue would say it's, you know, their core lines around 30%. Um, e Headspace would tell you again between 30 and 40%. So you, we're seeing gradual increases in people reaching out for services. But finally, we're also seeing an increase. And again, if you're particularly going to focus on an area, child and youth services, particularly the public and the more at the more sort of acute end are seeing an increase and anywhere between 20 and 30% we're seeing there. One of the things I want to raise particularly here and 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 this is part of the work that that that, that we're driving at the moment, particularly as a result of the pandemic, the increase in demand for services by children and young people and families who are struggling to support their young people in you know they they're needing the support. So I think part of it is, and people say, well, what are the major issues that we're seeing presentations, particularly in the public system, is depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and eating disorders, eating disorders. In fact, I would say, as I speak to a colleague who's a specialist in this area, it's not so much the classic eating disorders, you know, anorexia, bulimia, et cetera. It's actually eating disordered young people. And, that, and look, and we could unpack that in a whole range of ways about why and what that means, et cetera. But there's some of the things that we are seeing generally across the board, particularly young people. Why is some of this happening? When you look at it, young people, particularly the adolescent group, are seeing, for example, some of those, you know, those transition points in life being cancelled. So birthday parties, schoolies, uh, graduations. Uh, the uncertainty about where do I go from here, about university, job, all sorts of things. I've lost my part-time job. You know, all those things are impacting on young people at the moment. And they're certainly some of the things that we're seeing. So a focus on young people is critical. But we're also seeing parents ringing up about their, the little ones. So the sort of uh, the 12 years under. 
that also they're being impacted in many ways, particularly not being able to socialize. And I'm, I certainly, I've got family in Victoria, but also, I'm, you know, some of the other jurisdictions, et cetera, will tell you that you can see the impact on some of that child development stuff where kids have been primarily not being able to socialize, not being able to go to, you know, preschool, kindy, and all those you know, types of things. So we're seeing a development, but now parents are asking, what can I do to support my, that, the younger age group to explain to them a range of these things that are actual fact happening uh, for them and how do I deal with this and work with this to ensure that the impact is minimized. So these are some of the things that we're grappling with and I'm just about out of time. So, so just quickly to tell you about some of the things that we are, that we, that we are working on, but there's lots happening. And I have to say the Queensland government uh, has, has probably um, done something which I think has probably been, you know, sort of um, the only approach in the country was that they didn't have a health response to mental health. They took as part of their economic recovery plan, a response to mental health. $30 million to the non-government sector, drug and alcohol, mental health, indigenous, $46.5 million to the mainly the public system. But that was within their economic recovery plan. It wasn't a health plan. It wasn't a mental health plan. Because I think the government here realized, and, and which, which, you know, which I think is fantastic, you can't have economic recovery without human and social recovery. And within human and social recovery, mental health is critical. So I think we've been able to sort of have some major wins in that space. Just quickly, the education department, for example, here, I look at $100 million to look at the mental health and well-being of the young people in education. $100 million to employ 460 some odd uh, psychologists, social workers, nurses, et cetera, across a range of schools. But also 20 schools will have GPs embedded within those schools. So we're seeing sort of that more preventative stuff moving upstream. The other bit that we did, and you might have seen this, but we're also planning to do some more stuff. We did some work with Queensland Health around the Dear Mind campaign before the pandemic about how do you maintain wellness? And there's lots of resources and I don't, I, I haven't got the time to talk about them now, but if you're interested, look at that Dear Mind campaign. If people can actually run activities locally, we'd support that, would, would be fantastic. The other bit with that Dear Mind, we did something specific around the pandemic, as you probably have seen about how do you look after your mental health during the pandemic. But at the moment, we're having discussions around just the point I raised earlier about young people. How do we look at emerging minds? And what does that mean for young people, this pandemic, both the younger ones and families and more the adolescent, you know, the teenage type of group. So we're looking at all of that at the moment to, you know, to be able to do that. On a positive note, last year's data on the rates of suicide in Queensland have shown that we haven't had the drastic increase which was projected by the Sydney University that we would see a 25 to 50% increase in suicides. We haven't as yet, but we're monitoring the data very closely, I can tell you. And there seems to be a slight increase so far this year, but we're just monitoring that to see what that's about. But overall, all I can really refer to is last year's data. And last year was the calendar year that we collect the data through, through ASRAP and Griffiths University. It didn't show the spike which was projected by Sydney University, which I think is a good thing, but we've got to stay on top of this because certainly self-harming uh, behaviour, both online, on phone and presentations to ED is on the increase. And then finally, just wanted to touch base, we have also done some work with government around drug and alcohol, and we have put up a policy consideration for them about how to take reform in the drug and alcohol area forward. Uh, drug and alcohol and consumption of drug and alcohol has increased considerably during the pandemic, but it has been an issue for us for a long time. Remember, alcohol is a much bigger issue than illicit substances, uh, three to one primarily, in terms of the impact on society, individuals, families, community, government, the system, the economy. Alcohol is three, is three times more of an impact than illicit substances, but primarily around what, what we're suggesting to government in the new approach to drug and alcohol in Queensland is about let's divert people who have a health problem, an addiction, let's divert them out of the criminal justice system into a health response. If they haven't committed any other crime, apart, being, apart from being caught with small amounts, with small amounts of substance, illicit substance, 
for personal use and consumption. They're not traffickers, suppliers, or manufacturers. Let's get those people into treatment rather than into the courts and the prisons. So there's lots of things happening at this particular point in time, both at the national and state level. And I think we've got a lot to do as we go forward. But I think picking up the increase in demand for services overall, the impact of the pandemic, and how do we actually change the mental health system? And this is what I think the Victorians are trying to do now, and the Commonwealth money is trying to do that now, providing support for people in the community in situ when they need it without having to be at that really extreme crisis stage that you then need a you know, police officer and an AMBO to take you into ED. That's that whole shift that we're trying to make at the moment. So um, thank you very much. And I hope that was useful. Thanks, Ivan. Yes, extremely useful. I'm sure everyone will agree. Um, always great to have um, an update from you and I you know I don't, never want you to rush because you've you know you've got lots to say and um, uh, we, we really appreciate you taking the time. We do have a question. It's from Kathy O'Toole. I think Kathy's on the board at the Queensland Alliance for Mental Health. Um, she's asked a systemic review is long overdue. Ivan, do you have any ideas on how community can advocate for such a review? The attention on prevention and early intervention, they're critical. Look, look. I think, I think, uh, I think at the moment the community is already advocating now. Whether formally the alliance does or not, I mean, I, I, I haven't heard. But I think generally the community has been advocating for this. I've certainly had approaches to me, both from families, people with experience. I've had from agencies. I've had from the, the professional associations. So it's, it. I'm certainly hearing that more and more, and certainly the minister is as well in the government. Now, uh, I think uh, at at the moment, it's really I'm, I'm leaving it for a government decision whether they think a review is warranted and needed and then have a discussion around how that may occur. But certainly with both Cathy and Jennifer here online, it's it's certainly also an option for for for, you know, for the alliance and 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 other players, you know, like Checkup and others, etc. And people around the table here who may also have particularly strong views about the need for a review to express those through various channels, whether it's your local MPs, whether it's you know ministers, government, even myself, etc. I'm certainly taking all of that you know in my to my discussions with the minister and with government. Great, thanks, Ivan. I'm sure. Yep, there might be a few people online that will take up that, I guess, that challenge to um, you know make noise and um, let let their views be known. Um, Ivan, I believe you have to leave us now. You've got a busy day as always. So on behalf of um, everyone online, uh, thank you again for uh, giving us a presentation and I'm sure we'll see you. Um, well, we've got Queensland Mental Health Week coming up. Um, Lisa's gonna talk about that later. So lots happening um, in the next couple of months in the lead up to Mental Health Week. So um, thanks again, Ivan. And thank we'll you. see you very soon. I'll stay for a while. I want to listen to some of the presentations, but we'll just phase out as we need to go. So thank you very much. And I'm, I'll, I'll stay on for a while, but I'll turn my camera off so I can have a drink. <laughs> have thank a cup you. of tea. <laughs> Thanks, Ivan. Okay. Um, can, I guess, can you see, I think I'm online. Yes, I am. Okay, so next time, um, our next speaker today is Jennifer Black. Jennifer presented, I think you were rather new at the Alliance um, 12 months ago, um, but Jennifer is the CEO of the Queensland Alliance for Mental Health. It's the peak body for the community health sector in Queensland. Um, uh, Jennifer's worked in Victoria um, extensively um, with over 30 years experience in government, public, private and not-for-profit mental health sectors and I guess we're, we're touching on Ivan mentioned the the low end the middle and the sort of the extreme end and I think we're covering that quite nicely today from activities in mental health week right through to suicide um, prevention and general practice and and Jennifer your presentations on a new um, strategy uh, that the alliance has put out called well-being first so if you'd like to share your screen um, we'll hand over to you Jennifer to talk about that Okay, thank you and hello everyone. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, that's fine. Thanks. Just get it to full screen so you don't see what's coming. Is that working? No. Just click on. 
Ah, how about that? That's it. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so thank you, David. And yes, uh, the Alliance has um, just released a report called Wellbeing First, um, which is available on our web website if you'd like to read the full report. Um, so the Queensland Alliance for Mental Health is the peak body for the community mental health sector. So that's the not-for-profit grassroots services um, that deliver um, community-based mental health services to the community around Queensland. Um, and when the I've I've actually been with the Alliance for about eighteen months, and uh, of course, when I moved from Victoria, I thought. You know, never in my wildest dreams did I think that we would be in the situation we're in and um, not able to freely travel around the, the country. Um, so the Alliance wanted to do a piece of work um, uh, for a number of reasons, but this report sets out a vision for the sector um, for the future. And we took the opportunity at the beginning of the pandemic to partner with a futurist uh, and we also partnered with uh, Helen Glover and a range of key stakeholders within our uh, membership base and, and beyond. Um, so so what, what were the things that led up to us thinking about this? Um, well, it was a bit of a perfect storm, really. Uh, so we had COVID-19 that, uh, that had hit us for the first time in in my career in mental health, did we have the whole of the population talking about the importance of their collective wellbeing? Um, we've never heard that before, and that was an opportunity to, to start to think about, um, you know, the impacts of the pandemic on, on people's well, wellbeing, on their mental health and their wellbeing. Um, the Productivity Commission had just delivered yet another report <laughs> that outlines some sy systemic issues with the, with the mental health system. Um, and, you know, it, it quite compellingly pointed out that people are missing out on services that they could have uh, within our system, uh, that the acute system is under pressure, um, that the way people get mental health care in our current system is to present to ED or present to the acute services. Um, and whilst there's some early intervention um, in terms of, you know, some of the intervention in child and youth um, areas, early intervention in episode of illness is, um, is not strong in the way that we deliver services. And, and Ivan referred to the missing middle, which is a, an example of that. We also in Queensland had the introduction of a new mental, uh, a new human rights act. Um, so for, for decades, we've been hearing um, stories about how people are experiencing care. That was echoed in the, in the Productivity Commission as well. But this was an opportunity to um, think about our mental health services in a different way. Um, so look, Ivan's talked a little bit about the impacts of COVID-19. And yeah, it depends on where you get your stats as to what the percentages are, but they're pretty compelling. Um, but really COVID-19 has amplified the problems that perhaps the Productivity Commission has outlined. And I guess um, whilst it's easy to um, fund more of the same, I think the Productivity Commission and, you know, the voice of lived experience that for decades has been advocating for something different in our, our mental health system. But we do know that there's been a significant increase to support lines, call lines, um, you know, the surveys around uh, the population, 78% of Australians report their mental health is, has worsened. Uh, loneliness has become a huge factor. And in Queensland, we have a, a we currently have a, a, a review on loneliness and isolation and the impact of that uh, on the community. 55% of Australians drinking alcohol to hazardous levels, probably staying at home and lockdowns is really impacting on that. The impact on young people Ivan talk, has talked about a bit, um, but really, um, you know, some of those surveys that have been done have really talked about how young people have lost some kind of hope for the future. It's hard for them to see a way out of this and to see 
um, where their lives might go. Um, the impact on older people, not just from the disease itself, but who may have already been socially isolated uh, throughout this. Um, I was reading some stats yesterday on the impact on women, women who actually largely are working in some of those industries that maybe have, have closed down, so they've lost, lost their jobs or are subject to, to lockdowns, so they've lost uh, income. They may have taken the, uh, the, the lead on the homeschooling requirements that, uh, that really impact on women. And, of course, we know the geography of Queensland is that we do have... Um, a really diverse population. We have uh, isolated communities that don't have access to services, um, and we have, you know, uh, rates of suicide in some of those regions um, that that need some attention. Um, so, what are the arguments for change? So, I guess I'm just taking you through um, really what our report talks about and, and where we're going with it. Um, so we know from Royal Commissions, the Productivity Commissions, people's experience of care um, is not always ideal. People uh, report stories of feeling traumatised by the, uh, the mental health system. Um, and for decades, uh, many people have been talking about having a different sort of system that, that works with them much earlier in their distress and provides uh, practical solutions for them in, in relation to that. Uh, the Productivity Commission outlined the economics of um, investing in mental health, um, at which, was, which was a compelling 4,000 pages or whatever it was, Ivan. Um, so, uh, you know, really what we, what we were, what we're trying to create through our report is some alternatives to reduce the burden on the acute system. Um, some of people's experiences of care is that they need to present to ED to get a service. Um, so a crisis-driven service like that is not really helping people early in their distress. Um, so there's, you know, we believe there's some answers in this about uh, providing alternatives to actually filter people away from EDs to perhaps something that's more appropriate. Um, but change in the system is difficult. There have been many, many reports that have said the same sorts of things about our mental health service system. Um, and it has been difficult to enact those changes. Um, my view would be that we do need uh, some fundamental change and that might actually significantly change the way we deliver services. I think, unfortunately, for our sector, um, the Productivity Commission was largely silent on what um, the community mental health sector might be able to do in this space. Um, and one of the criticisms is that perhaps it doesn't have a strong enough identity. Um, part of the work we're doing here is to actually create create that identity and build on that identity. Um, so this, this is the bold vision <laughs> that everyone has access to support designed locally that prevents mental ill health, languishing and distress, that we all have the skills and resources to successfully navigate the vulnerable, uncertain, complex and ambiguous situations we face personally and collectively that everybody in the community can ask for help regardless of ability, health, social, cultural or ac economic status without being labelled a person with mental illness. And that we all value and invest in community initiatives that foster collective wellbeing. And our nation's productivity is measured not only in terms of its economic growth, but in terms of its mental wealth. So the emerging opportunities, particularly for our sector, so um, one of the things that we've explored in the report is that the, the absence of mental health is as bad as the presence of mental illness. So just because someone doesn't have, just because we can impact on the symptoms someone uh, has doesn't mean that they are well or are, they're, they're thriving in terms of their mental health. Um, and so I want to explore the idea of well-being as opposed to um, mental health and mental illness. We tend to use the terms 
mental illness, mental health, well-being, a bit interchangeably. Um, but but our report argues that they're actually two two continuums, and they can um, we can respond to them in different ways um, to get positive outcomes. So mental well-being, state of well-being, which the individual realizes his or her own abilities. Can't even read my own slide because the pictures are in the way. <laughs> and can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Community mental wellbeing is a combination of a range of things, um, and, it, and it involves a community response um, to help people flourish and work to their full, full potential. So uh, this is the two continuum model that I'm talking about. So it comes from, we've adapted this from uh, someone by the name of Corrie Keyes. And so most of our uh, mental health system is built along a mental illness continuum, which is the horizontal continuum here. And at any one point in, in time, um, we all probably sit along that continuum. Um, to low presence of symptoms to high presence of symptoms. I think Ivan was talking about the pandemic, actually perhaps taking people further along towards the lower end of this continuum. But we would argue there's also a continuum about wellbeing, and it's actually different from the mental illness continuum. And uh, Cory Key says that in the flourishing uh, quadrant there, where you have you know, high states of well-being and low presence of mental illness is probably in reality only 20% of the population, that everyone else is somewhere along both of these continuums at different levels of well-being and mental illness. And just because someone has a low presence of mental illness symptoms doesn't, doesn't automatically mean that they have high states of well-being. They can still have low st states of well-being being without actually the presence of mental illness. And I think the pandemic is really highlighting this and actually taking people into, um, you know, different parts of these continuums. Our argument, of course, is that the community mental health sector, that not-for-profit sector, has its real strength in working in the wellbeing space and along that wellbeing continuum. Um, and it does it in a range of ways from different, you know, well-being is not, is, is a range of things. Emotional well-being, people are satisfied with their life, you know, they're interested in good spirits. Social well-being is, is about um, connection and contribution to your community, um, you know, a feeling, a sense of belonging to that community. And psychological well-being is part of that too, um, you know, ability to adapt to your environment, that you can um, grow and develop personally, seek challenge, maintain positive relationships with other, other people. So there's a, a range of elements that we've outlined in the report about um, what contributes to, to wellbeing. And um, the, the final part of our report is thinking about what will it take to really change our services to, to actually think about um, operating in a wellbeing um, continuum. And uh, these are the elements that we've identified, that they really need to be population focused, um, locally responsive to the needs of that community. And that's nowhere more important than in Queensland when we have such diversity of communities. Um, they need a direct entry point without medical intervention. Um, you know, I might be saying that to the wrong audience here, but, but in fact, not all distress does need a medical, uh, a medical response. And at the moment, most of our systems are designed to take you through that pathway. Um, a wellbeing service would have a strong customer service philosophy. Uh, and relevant to people's needs. So it's actually meeting the person where they are and responding to the needs that are in front of them. The programs that they offer foster wellbeing and they do it early in people's distress so that they can build the skills that they need to, to, to stop their 
um, their health languishing into something more serious. Um, they take a coaching approach. So they're not there to do the doing, but they're to assist the person to um, develop the skills and do the doing themselves. Um, and they're person-led, not person-centric. Um, and they specialise in linking people to naturally occurring community resources um, and use technology where appropriate. Um, and that's, uh, that's probably my time. I could say, say a lot more, but I would encourage you to read the report and I'm, you know, I'd be happy to come and have a conversation, whoever wants to be part of this conversation with us as we take it around the state. Thanks, Jennifer. And can people download the report from your website? Did you mention that? Yeah. 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 Okay, fantastic. I'm sure um, people will, we might just pop your web address. Um, Martina, I'll get you to pop the web address in the chat function there. So if people want to go and have a look at that, um, they certainly can. Yeah, look, I can send you a direct link to the report because it might be a bit complicated to find amongst all the other things. So I can do that. that, that you can be wonderful. And a few yeah. people have been asking, will we send the, there'll be a recording of the presentation here today and we'll have that up on our website as well. So quite a few people want to send this, this presentation or this uh, webinar to their colleagues. So I will have that available for people. Uh, there aren't any questions uh, in the panel there, in the chat panel. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I really liked the quote there, um, Jennifer, the absence of mental health is as bad as the presence of mental illness. And I think it's just a really nice way or a clear way of thinking about things. And, and certainly the quadrant was um, something I hadn't seen before. So um, thank you so much for, for the work involved in pulling that together. And I'm sure it'll be an excellent resource uh, for people right around, not just Queensland, I guess, um, around Australia. So thank you. And you're able to, to stay with us? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Fantastic. If you could just um, stop sharing your screen, we'll then move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is uh, Joe Grislinska from Lata Consulting. Um, I think Joe's in, was it day 210, Joe, of lockdown in Victoria? Not that we're counting, but approximately. Not that you're counting at all, but... Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, Joe is a social researcher and a public health professional who specialises in system reform, reform, service design and practice improvement. She works predominantly in the primary mental health care system, um, working with PHNs, general practice and community-based services. She's got a particular interest in improving access to care and outcomes for vulnerable populations and works with consumers and people with lived experience using co-design approaches. And Joe, you've presented at another topic um, we've had previously. I think that was on the social prescribing um, theme that we had late last year. But great to have you along today. Have you got a presentation you're going to share? I do, I'll share my screen now. Please yep. let me know uh, once you can see that. Yep, that's perfect, Joe. Thank you, over to you. Great, fantastic. Thanks, David. Um, and thank you for having me here today and great to see um, so many people in the room. I will begin by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I am today, which is the Wurundjeri people. And of course, extend my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So following on from the previous two presentations from uh, Ivan and Jennifer, um, I really wanted to draw our attention to mental health presentations in a general practice setting and more specifically through the lens of suicide prevention. Now I will be talking about suicide for the next 10 or so minutes, um, so I encourage self-care for anyone who might need to take a break during this presentation to do so. So what do we know about the way that general practice and primary care settings respond to mental health concerns? I really wanted to share some perspectives that we've gained from some of the work that we've done recently. Perspectives from GPs, from nurses, from practice management staff, and from consumer and patient perspectives as well. I wanted to draw our attention um, to some of the opportunities which remain to build capacity in the system and to build, um, to respond better to mental health concerns to identify opportunities for earlier intervention, to keep getting better 
at identifying people at risk and to provide mental health care in a way that meets patient expectations. Now, my presentation hasn't jumped to the next slide. David, can you let me know if you can see a second slide? I might just give it another moment or so. Um, I did want to begin by just sharing a couple of key statistics, which probably aren't unfamiliar to many people in the room. We know that GPs are the first professional contact in over 70% of mental health cases across the country. We also know that 65% of GPs identify psychological issues in their top three most common presentations on a daily basis. When we look at suicide data itself, and we look at suicide deaths, we know that up to 45% of people who have died, in fact, presented to their GP in the four weeks ahead of their death. And in the and up to 20%, up to 20% of the deaths in Australia um, have seen their GP in the week before their death. What we don't necessarily know is the content of those conversations and those presentations and to what extent um, suicide risk and suicide ideation might have been disclosed at those sessions. Uh, Joe, it's just David here. We're still on the title slide. So um... I'm wondering if I could stop sharing and ask um, perhaps Martina in the background yep. to pull up the presentation. Yep. Martina's great. got that. So yeah, let's do that. So if you can hit stop share. Martina, great. you got that um, ready to go? Um, yes, I'm what... just bringing that up now. Sorry, Joe. That's all right. Not a problem. You can, um, I think it's slide two that we want to be on. Slide two. Okay. I will jump. So again, um, when we look at the actual suicide death data in Australia, um, we know that approximately 50% of people who die do in fact, um, or did in fact have a mental health diagnosis. And then finally, when we look at the evidence based for what works in suicide prevention internationally, we know that interventions in primary care settings, in general practice settings, in fact, afford some of the highest impact opportunities that we know of from an intervention perspective. So building capacity for general practice to respond um, shows some of the biggest impact in, um, in suicide attempts and suicide deaths. So at our end as an organisation that works um, specifically in primary care, um, we were really keen to, I guess, explore what the opportunities might be to build that capacity. And we worked with a regional and rural primary health network here in Victoria to explore some of the issues and identify some of the ways to respond. Now, hopefully you'll have a slide that comes up in a moment, um, but what we did during the course of 2020, we worked across six local government areas and we spoke to GPs across a number of different general practice settings. We spoke to 55 GPs across 45 um, different general practices. And those settings included uh, sole practitioners, corporate multi-site settings, uh, bulk billing only practices, ACHOs, uh, headspace centres, drug and alcohol clinics, university clinics, a, re a really good diverse range. We also spoke to nurses, um, and practice managers and practice staff. Great, thank you. Slide four would be good. Another key component of um, the perspectives that we collected was from people with lived experience of psychological distress and suicide. And that of course included family members and carers. And just to round out some of the perspectives, um, other stakeholders that um, had some feedback to provide, including emergency services, crisis support, mental health services across both public and private, academics, community service, that kind of thing, really just to provide that 360 um, perspective. So next slide, please. So in terms of what did we learn? And I'm really keen, I guess, to emphasise that today I'm just speaking to a, a slice of the findings um, and happy for anyone to reach out afterwards who wants to learn a little bit more about some of the perspectives. But in our conversations with GPs, we can speak to at least three broad groups of doctors in relation to the way that suicidal risk was managed. 
the first group um, are GPs who are very confident and comfortable in supporting mental health concerns and supporting suicidal risk. The second broad group was GPs who have a stable patient list or even closed books and who have really long-term ongoing relationships with their patients and feel really confident in being able to identify any deterioration or changes to their patient's welfare. And that third group of GPs is a relatively loose group, um, but it's GPs who spoke to us about tendencies or times where they avoid asking questions of patients, questions that may in fact elicit um, a disclosure of psychological distress. And I'll get to that in a moment. We heard that many GPs feel very alone and very isolated in their support of um, patients at risk of suicide. We know obviously that GPs prefer to work in teams um, and are comfortable when they work to the limits of clinical risk. And many of them are currently feeling very unsupported without timely access or in fact even access at all to acute mental health services uh, in a public system that's overstretched and stretched beyond capacity. Without access to public or private psychiatry or psychiatric liaison to draw on and without timely access to psychological therapies, where in Victoria, at least, many of the GPs have a six to eight week waiting list um, for their patients. Second to that, we also heard from many GPs that when they think about suicidal risk and patients at risk of suicide, they tend to focus on the patients who already have a mental health diagnosis, who they know fairly well through that diagnosis and who come to them expressing that suicidal, um, those suicidal thoughts. Many of the GPs we spoke to found it harder to comment on patients who experience psychological distress without disclosing that distress to the GP. And so we found that there are gaps in earlier identification of risk and gaps in um, the use of screening and risk assessment tools. And unfortunately, among the 55 GPs we spoke to, we didn't meet many who had actually undertaken any kind of suicide prevention training with the exception of registrars and early career GPs who tended um, quite often to be in that uh, very mental health confident and capable group. Many GPs told us that they rely on the familiarity with their patients um, in order to uh, inform their risk assessment. So we know that providing mental health support is challenging in a system that doesn't necessarily function effectively or cohesively. And for many GPs, mental health care can be difficult compared to supporting other medical conditions such as diabetes, such as cardiac issues, which have much more straightforward and functioning risk assessments, have timely referral pathways and good access to the necessary specialist care required. Now, if we can jump to the next slide, coming back to this issue of this group of GPs or the tendency for um, GPs who aren't necessarily confident to avoid asking questions of a patient which might lead to disclosure of distress. We heard quite frequently from GPs about this idea of appointment blowout um, and the idea that within a 15 minute appointment setting asking questions that might lead a patient to talk about their relationship issues or their unemployment or their drug and alcohol issues or their bereavement risks risk the chance of that time with the patient blowing out to perhaps up to 45 minutes up to an hour which obviously places additional pressures um, on the GP in that moment and for the rest of the day. The flip side of that was also um, should distress be identified many GPs who have um, quite full up appointment books who may not have another appointment available for three or four weeks felt uncomfortable with not being able to provide the necessary follow-up care. The earning capacity from supporting mental health care in general practice uh, was an issue that was raised um, repeatedly and sadly for some GPs. The ability to um, again that appointment blow out within the moment and then um, the effect that it has on some of the other patient throughput is a factor for some GPs in some general practice settings. And some of the emotional fatigue and overwhelm that can come from supporting um, mental health care patients on a regular basis becoming known as the go to GP within a practice to support mental illness. Some of that emotional fatigue um, around the heart sink patients, for example, um, you know, really uh, 
sits uncomfortably with GPs who don't necessarily have the support within their general practice or peer support or debriefing available to them um, to get them through that. We also heard some of the barriers from GPs around having no one to share care with. So the patients, the care of the patients with mental health issues and no one to hand over to in a crisis. So with a stretched public um, health, public mental health system and particularly anything after 5 p.m., the inability to um, provide the necessary follow up for those patients. Thank you. So when we look at priority populations, um, I've divided into two on the page here. Um, in the yellow and the grey at the top, we've got the populations that we um, heard about from GPs as being typical of those who present with suicide ideation or suicide risk. So we've got our mental health diagnosis, which I've referenced, dual diagnosis around mental health and drug and alcohol, people experienced with experiences of trauma. And obviously we've touched on um, the burden from COVID and the surge and uptick in presentations for the last 18 months. And we heard about farmers as a risk category as well. In our orange and blue boxes at the bottom, what we didn't hear um, as much about from GPs was patients who experienced barriers to disclosing psychological distress. And that might be patients such as men as a general category, young people, LGBTI community members, carers, young parents, elderly people, anyone for whom the GP might actually need to be able to initiate a conversation rather than presenting with the distress. We also didn't hear much, and I guess exploring that men as a, uh, you know, as representing 80% of the statistics around death, men as a broad at risk category, um, and particularly men who might be experiencing a, a cluster of risk factors around relationship breakdown, uh, child custody disputes, unemployment, drug and alcohol issues. Um, we explored this issue of how confident GPs felt in engaging some of those men and overcoming some of the barriers to disclosure. Um, but we definitely didn't hear these men and these risk factors discussed um, assertively by GPs as something that they were very familiar with. And I, we probably don't have time to touch on this, and this is probably a whole separate presentation, but when we reached out to people with lived experience, some of the key issues that we heard about was really the, the benefit of a, a good and strong GP patient relationship that's really trusting and it allows some of the disclosure of risk. Some of the cons of that kind of relationship in small towns where you might have a town with a single GP, for example, some of the issues around confidentiality might in fact prevent somebody from disclosing to their GP um, and community members are left in a position where they have to seek health care um, or mental health care outside of their town. Many patients and consumers spoke to us about wanting a compassion first and a trauma informed approach and avoiding that um, what can sometimes be a knee-jerk reaction to reach for the prescription pad um, for some clinicians. And they really spoke about wanting GPs who are confident and capable with mental health supports and with dealing with risk. They want GPs and nurses to have confidence to start conversations and keep conversations going and not always be immediately referred out of the practice. For those patients, you know, many patients spoke to us about wanting or having a medical home and wanting their mental health care needs and their suicidal ideation, particularly for chronic, for people who experience chronic ideation. They wanted that to be kept within house, within the general practice setting. Uh, we also heard about some general practice settings that might be high turnover or bulk billing settings, that kind of churn and burn approach where um, quite often driven by a medication first approach and really um, a reluctance by clinicians to actually build an ongoing relationship and to listen adequately to the person in distress. And also acknowledgement that for people who need, who might need an appointment with a GP um, more urgently, um, you know, reception staff doing their general reception work on a day-to-day -day basis might in fact inadvertently act as a gatekeeper to accessing an appointment that might be a little bit more urgent because of a crisis situation. So in terms of opportunities to build capacity, there's absolutely an opportunity to identify risk more frequently and identify it earlier. There's also an opportunity for GPs who are more confident and capable to sit alongside more clinical risk in a primary care setting and to develop some treatment skills for those GPs in contemporary approaches for working alongside suicidality. 
And we absolutely identified some opportunities to build core competencies to respond to specific um, community groups and groups that are more vulnerable to suicide or those that are more vulnerable to having barriers to disclose their symptoms in a general practice setting. So I've just, I've got a snapshot here for some of the key um, supports that we've recommended to this primary health network in particular, in order to uh, provide some more holistic um, supports and build capacity for GPs and nurses. We've had a lot of requests, particularly um, down here in Victoria and some of the rural and regional areas to have really up to date and current referral lists for um, providers who of psychological therapies. So lists that include waiting times and lists that specifically um, include specialisations and what's in and out of scope. Um, and one of the issues that came up um, responding to what Ivan mentioned before was that idea of eating disorders when that started ramping up during 2020. Um, psychologists who support and who are comfortable supporting eating disorders started closing their books very quickly during 2020 and we had GPs left with nowhere to refer their patients to. That issue of having access to psychiatric liaison is really critical. Also, when we spoke about earlier intervention to GPs, many identified that they didn't in fact have any pathways for earlier intervention. And the health pathways tools that's, uh, that are really common in Victoria, the online clinical tools for GPs, don't currently have any early intervention pathways. So connecting through to more community-based supports and some of what Jennifer was referencing in her presentation. The ability, as we know, to have um, a quick guide to put above the computer in the office, a risk flow chart. So stepping out, depending on whether someone's identified as low, moderate or severe risk um, and a quick uh, guide for what a GP should do in that instance. And again, some of those issues around GP self-care, well-being, and peer supports are high on the recommendations list. The other key aspect of the approach is really around building competencies for both GPs, practice nurses, and reception and administrative staff. So really taking that whole of practice uh, skills approach. When we talk about universal competencies, what we recommended was identifying warning signs of distress and recognizing depression skills in initiating conversation with patients who may face barriers to disclosure, providing ultra brief psychological interventions. So simple wellbeing interventions or brief counseling interventions for distress tolerance and ones that can prevent or delay escalation, plus providing escalation plans for family members who are supporting someone. Also as part of universal competencies, um, are those issues around working with higher risk patient groups and delivering trauma informed care, contemporary cultural awareness, safety and competency, LGBTI inclusive practice and ways to engage men. In terms of some of the advanced skills and that would be for a separate um, interested cohort of GPs, that's really around collaborative safety planning, a team approach to treatment planning, working with families, carers, natural supports, and also effective management after a suicide uh, attempt. And we've just got in the black there, um, the idea that as part of this, an approach to practice systems can be used. So really having a look at how software systems can be used for patient identification, where a practice might be able to um, build some lists of patients um, subject to diagnoses, uh, mental health treatment plans, prescriptions, and pull these together in a way that um, might identify patients at risk that can be, that can be assertively reached out to. So I'll end it here, um, but I'll make one final quick reference um, to one of the outcomes of this work that we did with GPs last year. Um, and we at LADA have started offering mental health education to general practice to support some of the needs that we heard about, some of the more general mental health care needs. Um, we're offering mental health skills training and focused psychological strategies training to identify and manage um, treatment for mental health issues and to support GPs to gain confidence in being able to utilise a range of psychological strategies. This training has been uh, developed uh, in partnership with people with lived experience and is delivered by GPs and a psychologist. 
Um, and the two sets of training combined really um, align with the state mental health strategy to build system capability to support the workforce for earlier intervention and to build on the reform that Ivan was talking about. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, very topical um, at the moment, and I'm sure, um, yeah, we can. Um, many of the issues you're experiencing experiencing in Victoria, we're also experiencing here. Obviously, not to the same uh, degree at the moment, and I guess let's hope that stays that way. But thank you for that. And if people want more information, can they? Um, we'll, we'll send people your contact information, particularly around the the training, because I think you offer it that uh, Australia wide the mental yes. health skills training? Yeah, that's absolutely right. We've had um, really good take up from GPs across Queensland, but absolutely is available Australia-wide. So I've got my details on the presentation there, but feel free to share. Fantastic, thank you. Um, all right, well, our last presentation um, this morning, I'm just gonna fix my screen at the moment. Okay, and we have Lisa Maynard um, from Checkup, who'll be talking to us about Queensland Mental Health Week, which is coming up from the 9th to the 17th of October. <clears throat> Excuse me, Checkups Coordinated Mental Health Week. This is our fourth year, I believe, and, and Lisa came on board last year. Uh, so it's her second year coordinating uh, this really important week. Uh, and it's grown um, each year. Uh, we've had to, as we say, pivot and, and offer um, People are offering online events and face-to-face -face events now for Mental Health Week. So we're really um, grateful to have Lisa give us an update around how things are tracking for this, this year's Mental Health Week and give you some information about how you could get involved. Uh, so Lisa, over to you. Uh, thank you, David. And just checking uh, my presentation is um, easy to see for everyone. Yes. Can you see it? Fantastic. So um, continuing on from David's acknowledgement earlier, I'm actually presenting from Brisbane. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm here today, and that's the Turrbal and Yuggera people. So um, just to give you a brief overview of um, the week. So um, it's held in October every year and it aims to shine a spotlight on both individual and community mental health and wellbeing. So it does take um, an all of um, population approach as well as um, highlighting and um, celebrating um, our mental health and community sectors and um, you know really wanting to make sure um, people are encouraging help seeking. So the week is funded by the Queensland Mental Health Commission. So that is, uh, you know, another part of the wonderful work that the Commission does is funding um, initiatives like this. Um, and as David said, it's the fourth year we've coordinated it here at Checkup. Um, but that coordination wouldn't be possible without a really strong cross-sector collaboration. We're really lucky to have support from um, organisations right across the state um, who make the week possible. So. This year, the week will be celebrated from the 9th to the 17th of October, and it aligns with World Mental Health Day, which is um, held every year on the 10th of October. So um, we're really looking forward to a lot of people coming together through local uh, grassroots events, conversation and, and activities. Um, it's already uh, quite a lot of interest in the week, um, especially um, with the impact that we have seen uh, from the pandemic. So hopefully it will continue to be bigger and better than ever before. Um, just to give you a bit of a um, you know, identity that uh, you'll be seeing um, is that um, we're once again going with the theme, take time for mental health. So this is the third and final year that we'll have uh, this at the theme, as the theme. And it re really recognises the importance of um, taking time to um, undertake activities that boost our mental health and wellbeing, um, seek help when needed. And it really works well aligning with uh, the Queensland government's Dear Mind campaign, which Ivan did mention earlier, um, which 
you know, does really uh, lay out those um, different things that you can do from the six building blocks of wellbeing. So we've worked with Queensland Health again uh, to get our messaging to align with these uh, building blocks um, and we'll be encouraging uh, Queenslanders um, to make a healthier relationship with their mind by doing activities like getting healthy, keeping learning, showing kindness, connecting more, taking notice and embracing nature. And so keep an eye out because we'll have lots of little um, initiatives and activities trying to get people involved with different things to do with uh, those six building blocks um, in the six weeks prior to um, Mental Health Week, which is coming up very soon. Uh, and we're very lucky as well to have had a beautiful piece of artwork um, created by Townsville artist Jesse James to inform our visual identity. Um, uh, you know, I would encourage you to see uh, the artwork and it's, you know, a bigger version up on our website um, and read a bit about Jesse. Um, he's a fantastic artist. Um, he also works at Open Minds and has his own um, lived experience story. So um, very, very lucky to have him on board and would encourage you to have a little look at um, our website and about him. Um, so I'm just going to really run through quickly um, some ways to get involved. And now you can get involved as an individual or, uh, you know, get go back to your organisations and um, get them to participate. And we do find that um, it is a really great way for organisations to, you know, actually take time uh, for their employees' um, mental health and wellbeing. Um, you know, a lot of places have uh, wellbeing initiatives and that sort of thing. And, and just adding in Queensland Mental Health Week and really pausing and getting involved um, is, is a way to sort of show you support your um, employees' mental health and wellbeing. So um, you can, uh, you know, host your own event and this could be, you know, inviting in a speaker or, or you know, doing something as a team. Um, or you can attend an event. Um, we've already had over 60 uh, events and some of those are public, some are private. Um, we've had a mix of virtual in-person um, ones come through already and are set to see a lot more. So um, you can search from your location or, you know, online if you want to join a forum or something like that and learn a bit more about mental health and wellbeing. You know, today might have inspired you a little bit. Um, so uh, just really quickly, um, one of the major events that is being held this year, again, is the um, Walk for Awareness, which is hosted by the Mental Awareness Foundation. So um, this is a really great one because you can get involved wherever you're located um, in Australia even, um, but there is a, their main event in Brisbane. Um, so checkups registered as a team. Um, and if you're interested, you can have your own organisation put in a team as well. Um, and then another event that's come back this year after um, having to be put on pause because of the pandemic last year is the Recovered Futures Art Exhibition by Richmond Fellowship Queensland. Um, so this will be at City Hall during Queensland Mental Health Week and it's a free event and you can go along and see a really wonderful collection of um, artwork by artists with a lived experience of mental illness um, and carers of those with a mental illness. Um, so that's another one to watch if you're in um, South East Queensland pop along to that one. Um, now, the agenda is out for the um, Mental Health Forum, which is hosted by the Workplace Health and Safety Queensland. Um, you may have seen last year they had a ton of online events and this forum is really looking incredible. Um, there's a lot of industry experts um, ready to present um, and, you know, share information on how to we can create mentally healthy workplaces. Um, so uh, tickets are out for that one now if you want to get involved. And then um, finally, I just want to flag that after also having a break last year, um, the Queensland Mental Health Week Achievement Awards hosted by Open Minds are back and um, Open Minds are ready to make them bigger than ever. Um, they'll be hosted at the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre on Friday, the 15th of October, and that's a breakfast. Um, I'm just flagging it because tickets, when tickets go on sale, they will sell out. They'll be very popular this year. So make sure you, um, you know, get yours as soon as they go on sale because that will be a really inspirational um, ceremony hearing about all the um, different things people are doing to support those um, with lived experience of mental illness across the state. Um, there's also merchandise available for sale um, with all proceeds going to this year's merchandise partner, which is Canefields Clubhouse. So for those of you that aren't aware, 
um, Canefields operate psychosocial rehabilitation for adults experiencing mental illness and they're located in the Logan um, Bow Desert area of Brisbane and so um, Canefields take all the orders and they pack and mail the merchandise out to people um, and they can also work with organisations um, that say are doing a really bulk order um, as well and then now another really important way people and organisations can get involved is spreading the word about the week, um, the message about the importance of taking time for mental health and encouraging help seeking, because that's really what the week is all about, is really getting that awareness out there. Um, and so to help you do that, um, we do have a range of uh, resources available. So there's everything from an event kit to help you you know, plan an event to email signatures that you can add to emails to help raise awareness during the actual week um, and a range of social tiles. Um, and now with the impact on youth um, that I mentioned earlier and quite a lot of feedback that we received um, last year from teachers, we've added in some school specific resources. Um, and so, you know, if, you know, you work with youth or you, um, you know, have uh, youth, you know, your parents um, or guardians um, to children, you might be interested in having a look at those as well. Um, so there's some available now up on the website and then we'll have some more linked to next month um, that our friends at Twinkle have created, especially. So that's um, teacher created resources um, and those will be free for download. So we're really excited to have that extra support um, for our young people um, across the state this year. And um, I definitely encourage you to go back to whoever in your organisation, if it's not yourself, um, that may be looking after your marketing and communications or your HR team um, and let them know that there are resources available um, that they can download um, and that they can reach out as well if they want to have discussions about how they can get involved um, or, you know, need something um, more specific because we really want as many people as possible getting involved in the week and, and sharing um, the messaging. So I've run through that really quickly because I was very conscious of the time. Um, but, you know, I really would encourage you to say visit the website and social channels, um, have a look around um, and please don't hesitate um, to get in touch if you have any questions after today or you just wanna have a general discussion about how you can get involved in the week.